Coming up on this episode of DL Weekly, D23 Expo ticket information, what is coming for Magic Key Holders next month, staffing shortages causing issues, new lightsaber accessories, a ton of new food at the parks, we talk about the upcoming Lunar New Year event, and more. DL Weekly starts now. This is your captain speaking to you from the wheelhouse. I'd like to welcome all of you aboard the DL Weekly podcast. For safe passage on our trip, please do not sit or climb on the outside railings. And be sure to watch your children. The water can be unpredictable in these parts, and we'd sure hate to lose any of you. Hello and welcome to this episode of DL Weekly for the week of January 19th, 2022. I'm Teg Bushman. And I'm Teresa Urban. We want to send a thank you to Sam B. for becoming an official weekly tier on our Patreon. Our supporters get some pretty fun perks like DL Weekly swag, bonus content, and access to our Discord community. If you would like some more Disney magic in your day, head on over to dlweekly.net slash support to join. Well, if you enjoy listening to the show, please consider rating and reviewing the show on your podcast app. It helps other Disney fans become weekly tiers and part of the community. Now let's get to the news. The D23 Expo is coming up later this year, and ticket details have finally been released. For D23 Gold members, a one-day ticket is $89 for adults and $79 for children aged 3 to 12. The three-day ticket is $229 per adult and $209 per child. This year, all ticket purchasers must be at least a D23 general member to buy tickets. Becoming a general member is free. Ticket pricing for the general members is $99 for a one-day adult ticket and $279 for a three-day adult ticket. Children's tickets are the same price. Also new this year is Hall D23 Preferred Seating Package that is available for $899 for a three-day ticket. Tickets go on sale for Disney Visa card holders at 10 a.m. Pacific on January 19th. General availability opens at noon Pacific on January 20th. So if you're listening to this, the podcast probably posts after 10 a.m. Pacific on January 19th, but... So if you're a Visa card holder, get out there and, and get those tickets. Stop sure listening, be... log in, get your yeah. ticket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the pricing went up from a couple years ago, mm-hmm. uh, which is you know fine. I think that these things kind of go up over time. It is interesting that they have the that you have to be a general member to buy any of the tickets now. You can't just be a regular person and not have yeah. any type of D23 membership. The Hall D23 preferred seating is what used to be called the Sorcerer's Package. Mm-hmm. I think that people maybe didn't understand what that was. So preferred seating, I guess, is maybe a little bit more clear. Uh, My biggest bummer about the whole expo is the fact that it's in September, which makes me nervous because I'd much rather have it be in August. And I know we've talked about that before. But the other cool thing, the fact that it's presented by Visa and Visa card members get to get early access to some things is super cool. There's also some Visa things that will be specific to Visa card holders that uh, like actually at the expo, which is super cool. And Walt's plane is going to be there, which I'm very excited about too. So these tickets go quick. So definitely, if you're thinking about going, get some tickets. Well, what are you excited about with D23? What isn't there be? Ex- what isn't there to be excited about with D23? I'm I am excited to have one already under my belt so i know i know what i'm getting into this time whereas last time when we went and it was our first time everything was new and i honestly did not wrap my head around how ginormous this event is until we were there and i was like whoa because i mean really the expo floor is you think it that has to be it because the expo floor is just huge there's just so much to look at so many different booths so many different vendors I mean, it's even with three days, I feel like it's really impossible to see and do everything because there's so many great things happening constantly and sometimes, you know, and at the same time. So I'm excited to go into it having more of an idea of what to go into just to see is that helpful? Is that not helpful? I feel like it'll be helpful. But um, yeah, so I'm just curious to see what our experience will be like this time versus what it was when we were there in 2019. Yeah, I'm also looking forward to people that have been to multiples, uh, multiple D23 expos have said that every year it's gotten better. So I'm interested to see what they even what they will have improved from last time. I know that in the article they talk about uh, on the D23 website, they talk about how they have more 
stages for some of their mm-hmm. talks and stuff in bigger venues, which I'm very excited about. But uh, yeah, so hopefully, if nothing changes in my work life, I will be there in September. I know, Teresa, you are, are, we're trying to get tickets tomorrow because we're visa yeah. holders. Yep. So we'll... We'll we'll let you guys know if we get tickets or whatever. I'm sure we will, uh, because I feel like with general admission t- ticket sales going the next day, there won't oh, be yeah. as many things. So I think it'll work out pretty well. Uh, the plane, I'm excited to see the plane. It's such an interesting thing for them to bring and and put on the D23 Expo floor, uh, because for a while it was sitting backstage in Disney World and just kind of the it's, weather it's pretty... was taking care of it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy because so for those of you that maybe haven't seen, D23 did put a like trailer teaser thing out about Walt's plane. So they will be it will be an exhibit featuring the plane and it's um, actually like somehow being funded by the platinum sponsor Amazon. You know, they made plenty of money the last couple of years. So I'm glad that they're investing it into something like the you know, like this. I, I wouldn't have thought Disney and Am- like, you know, Amazon funding something that is important to like Disney history. So I think that's pretty darn cool. But um, yeah, so they're going to restore Walt Disney's company airplane, which like Tag said has been backstage at Walt Disney Resort. And then they're moving it and transporting it to Anaheim. So again, that just gives you some like, for those of you that haven't been to D23, the fact that they are having an exhibit just for this plane in D20, like that just gives you an idea of how massive this event is because, right, Tag? Like, think of like if you put a, t- a plane in the <laughs> expo last year, like it would have fit fine. It wouldn't have felt like this massive thing because that's just how big the expo is. So, I just yep. so cool. I'm glad that this is getting some TLC because it was really sad that it was just kind of, I don't know, going to nature and the elements in the backstage of Walt Disney world area yeah we had jokingly when we were there in 2020 we're trying to figure out where it was and if we could like sneak our way back to see it but (laughs) i wonder how long this has been in the works of them trying to to i don't know renovate and and restore this so it that's gotta have been like i feel for the archives especially knowing that it's there and that it's just rotting had to have been just heartbreaking for them i'm sure they've been trying to to get this going for quite a while and so i'm glad that it it is finally coming together. I'm I'm curious to learn more about the plane and more about the process and you know how this all came to be that they're redoing it for the expo. Yeah. Well, next month is Magic Key Holder Celebration Month at Disneyland. Two posters will be offered to Magic Key holders, one featuring the mountains of the Disneyland Resort and the other featuring transportation. Of course, I'm very excited about the transportation one. The mountains print will be offered February 1st through the 15th, with the transportation print being offered February 16th through the 28th, while supplies last. PhotoPass Magic Shots were also announced a Peter Pan shadow shot will be at Disneyland, while a Steamboat Willie shot will be at Disney California Adventure. Both magic shots will be complimentary for magic key holders. These look fun. Like, again, small things, but I'm with you. I think the posters look pretty cool. If I could be there, I would definitely try and get my hands on these these posters because they're very fun. I like the design style that both of them have. They're kind of like mid-century modern feeling and like classic Disneyland feeling. I do think it's fun that you get to take a picture with Peter Pan's shadow. It looks like it'll be um, by the castle. So I will assume that it's over where you could get your picture taken with Mr. Toad back when Magic Keys first became a thing. And then, I mean, who doesn't love Steamboat Willie? That's over in DCA. It looks like, I believe this was a, when we were there, we didn't actually get to go do it. But I think this was where they would add Oswald in. So it's right as you enter DCA, just to the right of the mm-hmm. turnstiles. So kind of even before you get like to the flagpole. I'm interested to see what else they they bring out for this appreciation month because buttons right but i (laughs) but i feel like okay this is kind of cool to do the posters it's cool to do the magic shots that's something kind of neat and personalized and everything but i'm curious like what else because they made such a big deal about it and they talked about how there's this whole month it's going to be just for magic key holders and i don't know i just expect like crazy fantastical stuff like something that would be cool uh you know it'd be really cool if they would offer this is certain nights or maybe the whole of February is they should have like an extra hour, kind of like they did with the Haunted Mansion holiday, 
but like an extra magic hour for key holders. That's like the park stays open that extra hour just for key holders. Uh, and you could go on like everything. That would be kind of a cool thing. Uh, it probably won't happen, but that would be kind of cool. Yeah, I think probably right now with, you know, what we're going to talk about in the next story, it mm-hmm. might be more difficult to do since they are having quite a few staffing shortages and staffing issues right now at the parks yeah. because of illness and such. So it, they may have had something planned like that, but it might happen. It might not happen, depending. Uh, but, you know, I think what they're going to do is I think they're going to kind of slowly release this information instead of just like, bam, here it all is. This is what you get. I think it's kind of more fun to build excitement, build anticipation. The other thing, too, is if they need to adjust things, they can adjust things more easily if they haven't mm-hmm. already announced that something's going to happen. Um, you know, the, the magic shots overall, something very easy obviously very inexpensive for Disney to be able to provide. Um, But, you know, things like these little, these posters, obviously that takes more prep. You got to order them, hope that they come in in time, all that stuff. So I'm sure they may have things planned, but with the current state of the world, um, you know, maybe they had like buttons, for example, maybe they had all sorts of buttons ordered and they haven't arrived yet. So we're not going to announce that we're going to give these away because we don't actually have them yet. (laughs) You know, that sort of thing. So it'll be interesting to see how it morphs. I do... I do think it's fun that they're doing this because I don't think they did any like AP specific celebration month for annual pass holders. So it is cool that they're trying to make this a little bit more special for magic key holders. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what else they do. And uh, of course, if they continue to do this yearly, how it's going to morph and change, then when things are in the back to normal times, if you will, uh, what what it can look like then when they have the ability to plan ahead a little bit more than they do now. Mm -hmm. Some locations may have limited hours or modified menus around the resort in the coming weeks. This is due to the staffing shortages and rise in the Omicron cases in cast members. Without staff to work the kitchens or man the positions for different locations, Disney is unable to keep things running as normal. However, the resort has updated its protocol for positive cases and cast members to being able to return to work five days after a negative test instead of the old policy of 10 days after symptoms resolve. Everywhere, man. I mean, that's just the story right now. Oh, yeah. Staffing problems, you know, COVID cases going up. Of course, even if it's not COVID, there's like flu and cold season going around. Mm-hmm. So there's just a crazy amount of stuff. And Disney's trying really hard to still provide the best guest experience for people with what they have. You know, they're they're not closing locations in some cases. They're trying to offer, you know, modified menu items. Uh, when they have to, they will close a location, but they try not to do that. It sounds like from uh, the sources we got some of this information from uh, that they are trying to move cast members and stuff around because the downtown Disney district and the hotels seem to be where it's really hitting kind of hard. So I'm wondering if, if they're pulling people from those locations to put them into the parks to keep the parks operating well and kind of sacrificing, you know, the hotel stuff or whatever. But uh, I hope that, I hope that uh, the cold and flu season goes through pretty quick. I hope Omicron cases start going down. There's a lot of data to suggest that might happen uh, and things can get back to normal. And all these poor cast members can finally breathe and and be staffed properly again i just you know again i'll get out of my little soapbox again just super super important that we're very kind and very thankful and very just nice and all that to the current cast members that are there because i'm sure this is a very stressful time for them because you know they're getting you know potentially getting exposed more frequently now than they had been. They're getting tested much more frequently. I'm sure their schedules are getting, you know, it's probably changing daily. They might having to be hop from this this to that to the other and they're being more flexible. So I just feel like it's so much more important that we take the time to say thank you to cast members, to be very genuine when we say thank you to cast members, because I really think that probably goes an extra long way with them right now, because I'm sure it's it's not easy for them. No, no, I totally agree. And, you know, nobody wants to work in those type of conditions. And it's Mm -hmm. even more challenging when not only do you have just the working conditions of the fact that there's, you know, people are sick and all that good stuff. But then if you have people that, you know, you're trying your best to do the work of two, three people sometimes, 
uh, and people just still are not satisfied. So mm-hmm. you're absolutely right. Just be kind to people. Well, some more additions are now available for lightsabers at Savi's workshop in Batu. Two lightsaber hilts, one with a Lothcat grinning and the other with a Rancor. These screw onto the bottom of any lightsaber offered for purchase and are $24.99 each. There are no discounts uh, with these two items. So uh, the thing I was the most excited about with this news story, since this really is not up my alley, I was very proud of myself that I knew what a loth cat and a rancor was before I read what Teresa. they were. <laughs> so yeah, so since this is definitely more your thing, especially since you own a lightsaber that you built at Savi's, how do you feel about these and would you purchase one? Oh, that's the question. Uh, so the way that it, that I understand these is that they screw on to the bottom of your lightsaber. So instead of, uh, like for for instance, with my lightsaber, the the hook that I can clip it onto like a belt mm. loop or something, it's that piece would unscrew and one of these would screw onto it. I think the idea of it is cool. I think it's they're going to be very popular. For me, uh. I don't see any lightsabers with things like this in the in the cinematic universe or in the movies, so I would be reluctant to put it on mine because it it isn't like something you see in the in the movies or the shows. However, Star Wars universe is constantly expanding. You know, right now we got the Book of Boba Fett going, and we're learning all types of new things about all types of new characters and existing characters and everything else. So who knows? Maybe in one of the Star Wars shows or movies that pop up next these type of things will be adorned at the end of a lightsaber. So uh, maybe Mm -hmm. when or if that happens, maybe I'll be more interested in it. I do think they picked uh, some cool things, the Rancor and the Lothcat. Uh, But I'm sure that if they're popular enough that they will expand into some other Star Wars things because there are some cool creatures that I think would be neat to see uh, at the end of of your lightsaber. One of them that comes to mind is the, uh, you know, the, the, in the, in episode two, where they have all the animals that are attacking uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan and Padme, like there's a couple of those creatures that I think would be super cool to have turned into one of these. The one neat thing, you know, you're right. It's, it's not something that we've seen, you know, in universe yet. I do think it is a fun way and a like fitting way for people who want to customize their lightsabers even more. You know, it's just another thing that they can add to it to make their lightsaber more unique. Well, this week, it's all about the food. We're just going to start now. We're going to say it. Lots of food talk coming up. So hope hope you're not hungry because you're definitely going to be hungry after this. But we're going to start in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. A new dish has landed at Docking Bay 7, the Dewback Chili Noodles. This dish is made up of spiced pepperdell noodles and gingered ground pork with Brussels sprout leaves and shredded red cabbage. Guests can try this for fifteen forty nine. Uh, so I normally would look at something like this and think like, okay, it doesn't seem that interesting. However, <gasps> I had really? such a good experience with the last special item that they had at Docking Bay 7 that I am more willing and, and excited to maybe try something like this. However, if they still offer the noodle dish that I tried when I was there, that was a special, I think I'll have to get that because I thought that was so good. Um, but this looks interesting. Uh, they also said that, uh, you know, it says that there's that there's a little bit of spice with it, but I heard mm-hmm. that it wasn't too, too spicy, which is good because I don't do spicy stuff. Oh, I would 100% try this. This looks really, really interesting. Those noodles, they're... So, uh, I'll be honest, I didn't know what kind of... I didn't know what kind of noodles it were in this dish. I've not heard of Pepperdale noodles. I'm not even positive if I'm pronouncing it correctly, we'll be honest. But... <laughs> Looking at the pictures, they're a very wide, flat noodle. Um, Not quite like a lasagna noodle, but more similar to a lasagna noodle than, say, spaghetti. So wide, flat noodles. So I'm just, I'm super curious about this. And I'm also curious if it's like a traditional noodle, you know, just like a a flour noodle, or if it's something else, because the coloring in this dish is very different. The noodles are like, an orange. So I don't know if that's just what they're cooked in, if that's like the sauce or the broth, or if that's the noodle itself. So curious, very curious about this. If anybody gets this, you will have to let us know what you think. So according to a quick Google search, (laughs) uh, pappardelle are long, flat, and broad ribbons of traditionally egg pasta that originate in Tuscany. 
uh, a region known for rich, mm-hmm. intense, and generally meaty sauces. So the large surface area and rough texture of the pasta make it the perfect accompaniment to a more robust sauces and ragus. So very exciting. It looks very yummy. Very yeah. yummy. I like the fact that it's got Brussels sprouts, and because uh, I like Brussels sprout leaves. Uh, well, I like Brussels sprouts, but they've got, it's got leaves in there. It adds a little bit of a crunch. So it's got a good portion, too, for the price. So if it's still there when we go, I'll have to try it, I suppose. But mm-hmm. I don't know. It's going to be tough because I like that other dish as well. Well, good thing you're there multiple days. <laughs> right. <laughs> a new exclusive candy apple is available at Marceline's Confectionery in downtown Disney. The Grogu candy apple is a classic candy apple inspired by Grogu, also known as the child from the Mandalorian. The apple is covered in green chocolate with large eyes and, of course, cute little ears. The bottom is made to look like his brown outfit that he wears. Guests can pick one up for twelve ninety nine for a limited time. This has got to be the cutest dang caramel apple. I mean, come on. I don't know if I could eat it. He's so cute. <laughs> It'd they be do like, make his eyes look cute. Oh, my gosh. It's adorable. So, of course, we'll have a link in the show notes. Um, but they, yeah, super cute. They you, you can see there's actually a picture on Instagram uh, that Ken Potrock shared of him in downtown Disney peering in the windows as the candy makers were making these of Marceline's. And it's, yeah, just... So cute. His eyes. I can't get... And the ears. I mean, come on. (laughs) Well, you're a candy apple fan anyway, aren't you? I am. I do like the candy apples. I am... uh, I don't know if this is... If people are going to, like, think this is great or if they're going to think this is, like, terrible. Why are you doing that? But I'm a big fan of taking candy apples home and cutting them. (laughs) I I feel like that's the best way to eat them. It it is. I, I think it is. But some people, like, you know, maybe that's not, like hardcore or whatever but i just when i try and eat the candy apple on the stick it it is bad news bears so yeah so i like to take them home and cut them i feel like if you try to eat and this is why i don't ever get candy apples because i don't have the patience like you to wait to get home to eat it because like if i want one (laughs) i just want one but the i feel like the the one time maybe i had a candy apple like you bite into it and like all the chocolate fractures and then Mm -hmm. stuff is just going everywhere and it's just a mess. Although it, it I, I think I'm with you. Cutting it, I think, would be good. When yeah. you cut it, does the chocolate stay attached better <laughs> to the to the apple? It does. I cut it oh. in kind of like wedges. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. as you should cut it out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, hmm. no, I don't have too too big of an issue with the chocolate flop. You know, breaking off all over the place. Okay. When cutting it, that's my concern. So good to know. Maybe I'll try that next time. A new churro has taken the internet by storm this week. The Lemon Bar Churro has landed at the Grizzly Peak Churro Cart in Disney California Adventure. The churro is rolled in crushed vanilla wafer sugar with a tart lemon drizzle. The Disney Food Blog says it tastes just like eating a lemon bar, but in churro form. This version will set you back for six seventy five. dollars So I don't really have an opinion about this one. Uh, I di- for some reason, all this week on Twitter and Instagram, I've seen pictures of this thing. Like everybody was <laughs> trying it. It's I, I don't know why this is the thing everybody's really excited about this week, but it is. I won't eat it because I don't like lemon. I, I don't like lemon bars. Would try this. I one hundred percent would try this, and I think it's so intriguing because it's so different. Because a lot of times we get churros, and it's like chocolate and marshmallow and peanut butter and it's some combination of those three main things so where this is totally totally not something that we've seen for a churro before so i think it's i think it's interesting do i think it looks appealing no not so much like looking at the pictures (laughs) i'm like "Mm, gosh i don't i don't know but when i read what it was instead of just seeing the bright yellow drizzle on white churro i'm like okay I get it. So I would try this. I would. Yeah, I I think what I will say is I like the fact that, like you said, that they're getting away from just like the chocolate stuff and going into some different flavorings. Uh, So I'm excited for that aspect of it, but I'm just not a lemon fan. So if if it's there when you're there, maybe you'll try it, I guess Mm -hmm. is the question. Yeah, I would. Vern, would you try a lemon bar churro with me? No, because I'll be too busy eating it all myself. <laughs> Could you hear Why him? You? Yes, he's going to eat it all himself. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, if beignets are your jam, then stop by the Mint Julep Bar in New Orleans Square for a new flavor. The Butter Cookie Mickey Beignets are the classic beignet coated in shortbread cookie flavored powdered sugar. The cookie butter dipping sauce is an excellent side for this beignet and is sold separately. They come in a three pack for $5.49 or a six pack for $8.99. The side of dipping sauce is 89 cents. According to reviews, the dipping sauce is a must for this treat. This also sounds really yummy to me. Um, I cannot like stress and say this enough tag and i made a huge mistake when we were there in december we bought the what was it the peppermint churros yep or not churros the peppermint beignets mickey beignets and for and we somehow spaced the sauce we forgot to order the sauce there was no signage to remind us about the sauce so do not forget you do not get the sauce with it you have to order the sauce separately so don't don't make the same mistake we did. But um, yeah, no, I think this one sounds really good. Again, something different. Like I feel like we've had a lot of this, a lot of similar flavors with beignet. I mean, they, they are, I will say, compared to churros, better variety. But this one just feels a little different to me for some reason. So the idea of a butter of a butter cookie beignet just like all of that just sounds great i love beignets butter cookie sounds amazing it makes sense Mm. it makes way more sense to me than like a chocolate covered strawberry beignet (laughs) although i did like the strawberry beignet. yeah yeah but i mean this one just like yes this makes sense you know what i mean yeah yeah definitely beignets aren't the only thing with a new variation the royal street veranda now has limited time bacon cheddar jalapeno fritters Yum. The fritters are served with a cheddar cheese dipping sauce. The jalapeno is not overly present, so it isn't too spicy. There is a good mixture of flavors, but the fritter itself can be greasy. For $5.99, guests can get three of this new item. Sauce is included. Yeah, so unlike the like beignet, the greasy, yeah. you can get it with it. <laughs> I feel like the greasy thing is that's just kind of that's just kind of a fritter, because right, it's a deep, it's it's a deep fried. Um, bread. So unfortunately, yes, they can be greasy. So I feel like though, what might make it greasier is the fact that there's like the bacon as well. And the bacon has more fat content. So I think it's just going to be in general, like gooier. Although the review was interesting because the review said that you needed the cheese dipping sauce because it was dry, but then they were talking about how greasy it was. So I'm not exactly sure what all that means together. uh, But for me, I like regular frit- fritters. I'm not like a mm. spice person, although they did say that it isn't very spicy. I'm not. I'm also not like a cheese dipping sauce person. So this is another one of those items that just for me, it's not for me. But I do like the idea of the bacon. <laughs> I love bacon. Of the three ingredients, I like one of them. <laughs> basically, basically. I this one sounds pretty tasty to me. A savory. Fritter. I'm trying to because when we were there, it was a dessert fritter. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's nice that it's instead of it be because right we have a lot of desserts. Disneyland loves its desserts. They love doing different variations of desserts. We're gonna get into f- a few more of those. So I do appreciate and like when they have these savory snacks as well. Yeah, you're right. They do have too many sweets sometimes. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, a new take on a classic has appeared in Frontierland. The strawberry ice cream float is available at the Golden Horseshoe for $5.99. The treat is Sprite with strawberry ice cream and topped with whipped cream. Basically a root beer float, but with Sprite and strawberry ice cream instead of root beer and vanilla ice cream. The drink is reported to be a bit messy, so be ready with a lot of napkins. I like strawberry ice cream. I like Sprite. This no, I don't think I would try this. This seems, this seems like it'd be too sweet for me. You think so? Hmm. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I I I like strawberry ice cream just like you. I think as ice creams go, strawberry is is pretty up there for me for like yeah. ice cream flavors. I also like Sprite. I would be a little concerned with. You're right, because sometimes Sprite, especially like in the parks, can be very strong. Like I think that they have a heavy syrup to carbonation ratio. Um, But I like the fact that it's like a new take on a root beer float. 
Mm-hmm. Because I don't think I've ever seen anything with Sprite and different. I, like, I don't know. I'm just fascinated by this. So <laughs> I feel like I would try it. I don't know. I mean, I could make this at home. I could get some Sprite and some mm-hmm. stuff. So maybe I'll have to do that just to 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 answer that question in my head of what a root beer float that doesn't have root beer is. And uh, make sure you do just as the picture is showing us and put a mountain of whipped cream on top too. Oh yeah, I <laughs> love whipped cream. Of course I'll put a mountain of whipped cream. <laughs> well, with Valentine's Day coming up in less than a month, a new another new sweet drink has come, but this time to the Red Rose Tavern. The strawberry sweetheart tea is a black tea with lemon and is sweetened with strawberries. Don't let the name fool you though. It is a frozen drink that looks more like a smoothie than anything resembling you know a traditional tea or a hot tea the new drink tastes like sweet tea mixed with strawberry puree the lemon is not very pronounced and guests can enjoy this sweetheart drink for 649 in fantasy land yeah Sign so me i look i looked at this picture <laughs> and i would not if you just showed this to me i'd be like oh yes this is a smoothie like a strawberry mm-hmm. smoothie is what it or looks like to me or a slush or yeah or a slush yes uh, I do not see any dark colors that I would normally equate with tea. I also don't see anything that has to do with, um, what do they say, like some lemon, lemon. in there too? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't see, I mean, lemon's a little harder. But I don't know. I th- I don't know if I would ever put the, all of those flavors together on a whim, but I, I'd be willing to try this. I love sweet tea and I love strawberries, so... Ah, uh, yeah. No, this one makes a lot of sense to me. I agree with you. Looking at, you know, the photo is not what I would have expected. Um, and I don't think I also, with most people, when I read it being a tea, would not have expected it to be like a frozen slushy drink. But it does look very good and very refreshing. This would be great. I don't think it'll, it probably won't stay around long enough for it to be a like a spring or even a summertime drink for those really hot days to help cool you down. But it looks really good to me. Really good. Have you ever had a frozen tea or anything like this, tea-wise, that, that's frozen like this? N- nothing. I've had frozen, like, lemonades, not teas. Mm. You and I had the boysen, boysen apple um, drink from Reese's Treats. That's kind of like a frozen, um, that's more apple flavored, obviously. Yeah. Slush kind of thing. Um, but, yeah. No, I, I do like... These kind of slushy frozen drinks. I don't think I've ever had a slushy frozen tea. It is interesting, though. Like you were saying, the coloring doesn't really scream black tea at all. So I think it's 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 good to know that based on reviews that you can taste the sweet tea flavor yeah. in addition to the strawberry. It's just so different. It's just so mm-hmm. different. Well, fans of the Hungry Bear and the funnel cakes at this location should get excited. A new red velvet funnel cake is offered for the Valentine season. The funnel cake is made with red velvet batter and topped with cream cheese icing, strawberry ice cream, and whipped cream. It can be a bit rich, but looks like an excellent seasonal offering for $8.99. I will be up front. I have not tried any of the funnel cakes at Hungry Bear or in Disneyland at all. But every time I see these pictures, I just think... Wow. Like, what else could they possibly throw on top of them, right? Because there's, it's it's a lot. You've got the fun. They're big. They look very large, too. And I know people that have, you know, people in the chat that have had them. And they're always great reviews, but they do say it's good size, good sharing size. I would try this. I don't, for some reason, the ice cream on the funnel cakes just isn't maybe my thing. Because when I think of a funnel cake, I think of it being, like, warm. So the ice cream kind of... I don't know. That just kind of throws it off for me. But I would like, I would definitely try the red velvet funnel cake with some of the icing of the cream cheese icing. That sounds pretty darn good to me. You know, it just, what it makes me think of, because you're talking about the the difference between like something warm and like Mm -hmm. the ice cream. It reminds me of like a brownie. I love a hot brownie with, with like ice cream. So to me, it kind of feels that way. I love red velvet. I don't know how red velvet would translate to a funnel cake necessarily. Cream cheese and velvet, red velvet always go together. So I'm glad mm-hmm. that they have some cream cheese like frosting or whatever on there. Again, they must have gotten like a special deal with strawberry ice cream because <laughs> I feel like it's kind of everywhere tonight. It's because it's pink and it's Valentine's Day. It's, it's all about the colors. It's all about the aesthetic. I hope <laughs> that this is still around when we're there, but I don't think it will be. But man, I want to try this so bad. Okay. Uh, if you anybody get is- it, I'm taking just one bite. That's all I want. 
That's fine. I will <laughs> eat the rest. If if anybody listening gets this, please send us an email, feedback at dlweekly.net. Let us know what you thought of it because I really, really want to know. Although, if it's really good, I'm going to be sad because <laughs> I won't be able to I, I'm going to expand that out. If anybody, you know... It, of the listeners listening, if anyone tries any of these new food yeah. offerings that we've talked about, because there were a lot of them, please let us know what you think. Um, you know, was it a hit? Was it a miss? Was it a please add this to the regular menu? We want this all the time, like the churro toffee cold brew was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but or was it a total miss? And it's oh, way too sweet. Oh, way too you know whatever. So I like I'm your other cold curious. brew was. Mm-hmm. Yep. Speaking of cold brews, this did not make it into the official news, but I did see something online that there is a new cold brew. There is a horchata cold brew. Ooh, in that's right up your alley. Oh, that would be yum. So good. I want to say, hang on, give me a second before I say it wrong. I think it was a rancho. There we go. Refreshing new horchata cold brew at Rancho. One of the many seasonal offerings at Disneyland is this new horchata cold brew. Yum. So if you're interested in... Oh, oh my. They're outdoing themselves. Tag, they have two sizes now. You can get a regular for $5.99 or a large for $6.49. They are just like feeding all of our coffee addictions like none other. Well, which side would you normally get? Regular. That's the, the size that... like. So when we were there in December, all the iced coffees and cold brew coffees that i had that was those were regular size so a large would be quite large i think but if you need you like horchata i love horchata yeah i love horchata i love cold brew this sounds like a really great combination in my opinion and i feel with just having the churro toffee cold brew right cinnamon in both of them so i think it'll be similar not the same but i think it'll be similar so if anybody tries the horchata cold brew. Please let me know how mo- amazing and wonderful it is. <laughs> well, the horchata cold brew might hang around for a while. I hope so. Psst, of us there. Here comes seeking questions and long lost Disney information, eh? Sure, you come to the proper place, but keep a weather eye open, mates, and hold on tight. With both hands, if you please. There be squalls ahead, and James and Vern waiting for them what don't answer correctly. Welcome to Trivia Land. How are we feeling tonight? I'm not sure. Depends on the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm feeling optimistic, but uh, we'll see. Okay, good. Well, when I found out what tonight's discussion topic is, I realized that... Shortly after Christmas, we did the Christmas topics, or the Christmas questions, and now here we are recording on January 18th, and we have yet to do New Year's Eve questions. Oh. And since you're discussing the Lunar New Year, we, we're already this far past New Year's Eve. We have to finally get to some New Year's Eve questions. So the whole time that you've been recording, I've been here doing one of my famous deep dives, and I've come up with some great questions regarding the history of New Year's Eve in the parks. So are you ready to learn all or to answer questions all about New Year's Eve? We'll find out. All right. I'm going to say no. But... <laughs> well, let's see how you do. Your first question from this deep dive. With 7,500 guests attending, what year was the first New Year's Eve party at Disneyland? The first party. Hmm. I'm going to say 1955. I have no idea. So I have a technical question. So are we saying the... So because the New Year clicks over, are we saying... Are we saying... So like, for instance, this last year... Are we saying 2021 was this last New Year's, or was it 2022 was this last New Year's? 2021 was this past New Year's because okay. the party was held on December 31st, 2021. Okay. Ah, there you go. So it ended I will on say January 1st, 2022. Got it. 1962. 62? Yeah. And what did you say, Teresa? 55? 55. I have no idea. <laughs> and that doesn't sound like a very high number. 75? 100? Right? 
Seventy five hundred in yeah, attendance. Seventy five hundred is not a very large gathering. So Yeah. And that was in nineteen sixty two from UTEG? Yes. Okay. And your second question. New Year's Eve of what year launched the first Disneyland fireworks show entitled Fantasy in the Sky? Oh well this is a hint up my it would be answer. after the first New Year's. Because I think Fantasy in the Sky was like 57. So I'm going to say 1957, which means my previous answer is going to be wrong. Because it was either 57 or 58, Fantasy in the Sky, I think, started. Although I don't know anymore. You've, I, you've, yeah. you've made me not know anything anymore, Vern. Right. I'll go with 1958. Because why not? I'm really bad. I don't know. I'm, so that's a 57 and a 58? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm not... Very, I, I don't know the fireworks shows and the years really at all. You know, all. you would think for the amount of love I have for the fireworks shows that I would be an expert on this, but I am not. You know what? I'm I'm rethinking this. 58 Uh-oh. seems awfully soon for a fireworks show. Fantasy in the Sky. Uh, you already locked in a final answer. Okay, so fine. your third question. In 1970, <laughs> a giant Mickey clock was placed where on New Year's Eve? A giant Mickey clock. Yeah, the classic Mickey clock. Yeah. People put them in their it's kitchen. It's gotta be. It looks the same as the one on your watch. Oh. I would say like in front of the castle. Yeah, I feel like in front of the castle is the obvious answer, but I also feel like it could have been on the train station. Yeah. Or that... it could have been on the Matterhorn. So which one are you going with? I'm going to go with my gut and I'm going to say on the train station, but you're probably right with the castle. It could be on Tom Sawyer Island for all we know, because we're just kind of grasping here. <laughs> that is true. Are you sticking with the castle, Teresa? Sticking with the castle. All right. And your fourth regular question. Prior to 1984, you needed to buy an advance ticket to attend the New Year's Eve party. What happened that year that ended the need for the advance ticket? Well, that was getting rid of the ticket books, I think. That would make or was sense. that eighty three? Was that eighty three? That might have been eighty three, though. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm no, I'm gonna go with you because that would make sense. Yeah, they got rid of the ticket books, so you just had um, the general, you know, a ticket, a general admission ticket price versus the passport is what the, they called it. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. That's what I'll stick with. That. Final answer: the ticket books. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like. Not confident about any of my answers this nope. week. Nope. That's probably the one I feel the best on, because that makes the most sense. Mm. <laughs> and for a bonus question, 2001 was the first year that Disney California Adventure hosted a New Year's Eve party. Why was there not a New Year's Eve party in DCA before 2001? Because it didn't exist. I was going to say, because it wasn't there. It was a parking lot. <laughs> yeah, it did not exist. It opened on February... Ooh, February something, 2001. Is that your final answer? Final yeah. answer for both of us. Okay. I mean, I guess they could have held a party in a parking lot. No one says you can't. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Teresa. <laughs> well, listeners, did you know a lot about the, past, the history of New Year's Eve at the parks? Do you think Tag and Teresa knew a lot about the history of New Year's Eve in the parks? No. Nope. Stay tuned until after the discussion topic, and we'll find out together. So for this week, our discussion topic, we're going to talk about the Lunar New Year, the festivities that happen at the Disneyland Resort, past and, of course, present. With the Lunar New Year celebration kicking off later this week in DCA, we decided to take a look back. The Lunar New Year celebrations were originally held at Disneyland. The event was called the Happy Lunar New Year celebration at the time. The first Lunar New Year that was celebrated in the parks was back in 2011, small little thing that they held during what they were calling Family Fun Weekends. Uh, We do have a link, actually, 
actually, to the Disney Parks blog post about the family fun weekends. But basically, it was just that. Events that happened Friday, Saturdays, and Sunday. Um, They had a festival arena that was located off the Big Thunder Trail in Disneyland Park. And the first time that we can see Lunar New Year being celebrated in the park was during was during this they i do think it's cool because a lot of stuff if you read about details about different entertainment offerings a lot of the stuff that we see today was actually at this first lunar new year celebration in disneyland things like a quote-unquote lunar new year celebration party which includes mulan and mushu which was an interactive parade with colorful performers in costumes um and then of course we had fun other entertainment offerings too that we'll kind of talk more about in detail but so lunar new year it feels like it's been going it seems like it's just like a staple of the park and that it's been there you know for i don't want to say forever but it just it feels like it's been a while but first one was in 2011 yeah i uh agree with you i feel like the lunar new year i feel like it's been around forever uh, in fact, I had forgotten that it started in Disneyland. I thought mm-hmm. that it was kind of always in DCA for some reason. So the fact that it started at Disneyland in that festival uh, arena that was back there, which is now one of the entrances basically yeah. to uh, Galaxy's Edge. But they used this this space for a lot of different events and this uh, family fun weekends that did Lunar New Year. Same thing. Uh, you know, they used that space. So... So the family fun weekends were just, it was two weekends that they celebrated Lunar New Year, so a total of six days. But the earliest that I was able to find full event details as well as photos was from the event celebrated in 2012. So Lunar New Year is a special time when friends and families gathers together and wish each other good health and fortune for the coming year. So the celebrations at Disneyland pay tribute to that time-honored tradition and celebrations of the Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese cultures. So the festivities in the park lasted for nine days in the second year that they did it in 2012. So uh, pretty cool. I also wanted to say, because we were talking about the Family Fun Weekends, that the original one had a fiesta fiesta time, a Disney's Kicking Country weekend, the character fan days, of course, Lunar New Year, which we talked about, and uh, three weekends of Mardi Gras. Ooh. So uh, I didn't like, honestly, I don't even remember Family Fun Weekend. So uh, learn something new when we're talking about <laughs> Lunar New Year. <laughs> there you go. Well, the fun took place over at the Small World Mall when Lunar New Year was became its own separate event and not just part of the Family Fun Weekends in 2012. The area was beautifully decorated with banners, lanterns, statues, and even some blooming cherry trees. Entertainment included character meet and greets, demonstrations by artists, and an area to twirl ribbon wands with costumed dancers. Mulan's Chinese New Year procession was an event highlight. The procession took place as Mulan and Mushu, accompanied by dancers, would go to and from their meet-and-greet areas. On select dates, performances by Chinese dragon dancers, Korean drummers, Vietnamese musicians and dancers, as well as martial artists took place. So, it must have been popular, right? Because I feel like it just keeps expanding. Because first oh, yeah. it was part of this weekend's, and then they moved it into a more prominent location, you know, off of Big Thunder Trail, like onto Small World Mall, which is, mm-hmm. you know, pretty a pretty good area if you want to have a lot of traffic and everything. Uh, Of course, you've got It's a Small World there, which celebrates like all the nations of the world and everything. So that's kind of cool to have it by there. Uh, So that's really neat that this, and now it is, you know, it moved over, we'll talk about this, but it moved over to DCA and now has become this uh, big thing that they celebrate every year. So how cool that guests really reacted so well to this, that it was able to kind of expand and, you know, bring more stuff. And as we've seen, especially after Coco came out, it seems like Disney's doing a really good job of having, you know, bringing different cultures into Disneyland where, so with this, you have, uh, you know, Chinese and Vietnamese and, um, you know, background and stuff like that in Korean. And then of course, with all the stuff from Coco, we had a lot of Latino uh, and, and Mexican culture and stuff brought in. So very, very cool that that they're starting to do more and more of this kind of stuff. And obviously, it's very popular with guests mm-hmm. because all these things keep expanding. Uh, and like you said, a lot of these things are continuing even now that they've kind of added to each time. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I don't know if they... I, 
they don't still have the Korean drummers, do they? Or do they? Because I feel like I'd love to see them. They do. Oh, they still have I feel... drummers. Mm-hmm. Mm, I love I love drummers. Uh, well, would it be a Disney festival if there wasn't any special food offerings? Of course not. Uh, the menu looked much different back then, though. The festival food items were available at food carts in the area. The offerings were mostly snacks and included egg rolls, edamame, almond cookies, and strawberry churros. The festival moved to DCA in 2013 and has expanded just about every year. New entertainment, food offerings, festival merchandise, and even a longer time to join the celebrations. Currently, Lunar New Year festivities span over 23 days. That's so from a- nine days in 2012 to 23 days now. Whew. That, that, but 2011... You had two weekends, so you had it went from six Four. days oh, to six, yeah. weekends. Oh, yeah, because you count was, Friday. Yep, two were just there for for New Lunar New Year. So yeah, it's it's really cool to see how this event kind of you know started small and has just gotten bigger and better every year. It's interesting. I mean, we're going to get into the food later, of course, that you can look <laughs> forward to for this year. But I was just blown away because right, food is such a big part of Disney festivals now. So the fact that in 2012 they had like four items and they were all like small snack items and they weren't really, um, you know, special or unique. They're, you know, they, they, they kind of just like check the box, like, okay, we have some things that kind of fit the theme onto the next thing. So I just think Mm -hmm. it's interesting that we went from one, two, three, four, four different food items to how, like probably more you know how many food booths do we have now compared to food items we have more booths than items i think so Mm -hmm. it's pretty it's pretty incredible the other cool thing too is that the entertainment it didn't take place every day so you had to you know pay attention to the schedule if you wanted to catch any of these enter the entertainment the only thing i that looked like it happened daily was mulan's chinese new year procession um but as far as like the drummers and the chinese dragon dancers and the other dancers musicians and martial artists that wasn't a guarantee that those things would be happening on your park day so that was also pretty pretty special that we get a lot more of that entertainment now when you visit that you're almost i wouldn't say you're guaranteed to see every aspect of entertainment but there definitely will be some sort of entertainment going on when you're there i like how they integrate all of these cool things from these different cultures too uh oh, with yeah. you know disney characters of course you got like mulan and mushu uh, obviously recently you were able to add raya from raya and the last dragon because that's all kind of yeah. the same kind of culture there as well but i'm looking at some of these pictures that we'll have linked in the show notes from from the different entertainment and stuff and a lot of this is e- even though it's at disney it is. It seems very authentic to their traditions and stuff, and and uh, from the cultures. So it's nice to see that they have Disney elements, but haven't made everything just Disney. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. So now that we've taken a look back in the past to kind of see where the new Lunar New Year celebrations started at the Disneyland Resort, what is there to look forward to this year? Well, I feel like a, a ton. Lot. A ton. There is so much to look forward to. Uh, we're going to start with the food, though, I think. Um, it just, I, yeah. Lunar New Year Because we is, haven't talked about food enough in this no, episode. No, we haven't <laughs> talked about enough food. So we're going to talk about food. Um, so there are four marketplaces that you can enjoy food from along the parade route, in addition to special offerings over at the Paradise Garden Grill. So let's just look at each booth as it is, MiceJet had a really great article. Of course, the links will be in our show notes. Disney has not officially released their food blog or their foodie guide yet for Lunar New Year, but the booths are already out. So MiceJet was able to snap some pictures of the offerings for this year. So first booth is called Longevity Noodle Company. Looks like they have garlic noodles, spicy pork dandan noodles, as well as a salted pistachio cold brew. Um there's also oh, there's a, a cold brew for you. Yep, there's a cold brew. Um, there's also a beer, Young Master Brewery Neon Pale Ale with Mandarin. Ooh. They also have a uh, Lotus Flower Glow Cube, which you know me and Glow Cubes. That's but totally I will say beer. that's totally up yours. The number one item on this list with the garlic noodles. This like this sounds so so good it is long noodles tossed in a zesty garlic butter with parmesan oh i'm telling goodness, you both of good. these noodle dishes sound good because the spicy pork dandan noodle 
is pan fried noodles with ground pork and a spicy tri chili blend sauce. Maybe mm. maybe that might be a little spicy for you, but that one yeah. sounds very flavorful to me too. I'm gonna be honest though. I'm a little scared and a little hesitant of the salted pistachio cold brew. That one doesn't jump out to me as a oh, gotta have it, must try it. I don't sure. I don't know what's what's making me a little hesitant. Will I try it? Would I try it? Heck yes, I would try it. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to go out to the Chinese or the, we're not gonna be able to go out to the Lunar New Year celebration this year. So I won't be able to try it. But I'm I'm curious. I'm very curious about that I one. I feel like the description sounds good because it's Joffrey's Coffee and Tea Company French Bistro Blend Coffee, Orange Blossom Honey Syrup, which both of those sound great. Yeah. Uh, oat milk. Mm-hmm. And I then like they have a milk. salted pistachio foam. So it's just the foam. So I, I think yeah, that... The, yeah, the salted pistachio foam is the one that I'm like, I... Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. So the next booth is the Lucky Eight Lantern, and this is over by the Golden Zephyr along the same area. And the dishes here are the shrimp fried rice, a beef bulgogi short rib. Yeah. Uh, for drinks, there's a peach y- yuha ade. I don't know how to pronounce that. I apologize if I've butchered Ooh. it. A soju peach yuha ade <laughs> drink. Again, I'm sorry that I've butchered this. And a Cloud Brewery beer. Uh, you can also get the same Lotus Flower Glow Cube as well. Man, those short ribs. those The beef bulgogi short ribs sound absolutely delicious. These drinks sound really interesting to me, too. So the peach Yuha Aid is peach syrup, Yuha dragon fruit, lemon, and butterfly pea flower tea, which was that butterfly pea flower tea was in one of the holiday drinks that we tried yeah. um, in December. And then the soyu peach Yuha aid is soyu peach syrup, Yuha dragon fruit, lemon, and again, the butterfly pea flower tea. It sounds, they sound very unique and very refreshing. And peach. I know I I know peach. I love peach. Dragon fruit is in both of them. Lemon is in both of them. But yeah, they sound really, really good. I would try those for sure. Our next booth is Prosperity Bow and Buns. I feel like this is gonna be Tag's booth. Mm. <laughs> we have the Char Char Su Barbecue Pork Bow, a Mickey Chinese hot dog bun, and then we also have a prosperous tiger drink and a lychee celebration drink. Yum. So I'm looking at these things and of course like the barbecue pork bao sounds great but mm-hmm. I was like a Mickey Chinese hot dog bun. <laughs> I'm like this doesn't sound great. But then I read the description and I'm on board with this because I love brioche. So there's a brioche style Mickey shaped bun stuffed with sliced hot dog and finished with sesame seeds and scallions. I don't know if it would be good, but I'm intrigued by the <laughs> fact that it's a brioche style bun with sliced hot dogs. Uh, like I, I would definitely try this for sure. And the other two are actually alcoholic beverages. So yep, the other two not usually are on our list. Alcoholic beverages. Hi, you know they they do sound interesting because they're just they're different. It's not your standard. I don't know, Long Island iced tea or something that you can get just anywhere. These are these are very unique sounding, which I think is great. Sure. The next booth is the Red Dragon Spice Traders. And there they have a spicy three cup chicken, a impossible lion's head meatballs, a Mickey purple sweet potato macaron. Uh, for drinks, they have something called a dancing firecracker, which is non-alcoholic. And another uh, set of another uh, beer option as well. I this a lot. This all sounds good to me. Um, I would try the spicy three cup chicken. It's served on a bed of jasmine rice. But I'm really intrigued by the impossible lion's head meatball. So they're mini plant based pork meatballs served with cabbage and a, you know a wine reduction. They mm, I have been. I feel like I, I'm a broken record, but I've really been enjoying their um, impossible foods that I have tried there and other plant-based options that they have. They've all been really, really great. Um, I'm also very curious about the Mickey Purple Sweet Potato Macaron. How are you feeling about that? Well, first of all, I want to agree with you. The, all the impossible stuff we've had at Disney has been amazing. Mm. And so I feel like the... I like meatballs anyway, so I feel like this would be really good. The description also sounds very good. The Mickey Purple Sweet Potato Macaron 
is a red macaron filled with a purple sweet potato buttercream with a creme fraiche center. So I love sweet potato. I think it'll be interesting because it seems to me if you have something that's sweet potato, that it that maybe they're trying to make it a little less sweet and a little more savory and more healthy for you, perhaps. I mean, it's still a macaron cookie, but <laughs> I, I'd be... It's a macaron, of course, I'd want to try it i'm just Which, laughing at the thought of a healthy macaron <laughs> i i also want to go completely off topic for a minute um uh, i went uh, a week ago a week and a half ago i went to um the Hmong grocery store because i wanted to make some pho for for lunch when everybody was kind of sick for those of you who don't know pho is kind of like a, a broth with some noodles it's a you can buy it a lot of different places but it's really really good and uh one of the one of my classmates uh told me how to make it at home so we were able to uh, make it at home and it was it's been really good but anyway i went to the mung grocery store and they had a box that was macarons and i was like of course i'm gonna buy this and then i got it home and i opened it and it was not macarons like i know macarons it was kind of more cakey they were very good still but i was devastated when i opened the box and it wasn't a french macaron i'm like no (laughs) Why would you do this to me? But then it ended up still tasting good. So well, there it's you go. Fine. I'm also very curious about the dancing firecracker drink. This drink, if I were to, like, if I had to choose one drink, this would be the drink that I would choose to get at the Lunar New Year. It's pineapple juice, guava puree, spicy honey syrup, hibiscus syrup, and lime juice. It does sound good. The only thing mm-hmm. I'd be worried about is the spicy honey syrup, but it depends like, on how much they put in. Yeah, spice. I mean, spicy syrup sounds a little. Ooh, I don't know, but the fact that it's with honey, I think it's probably. I think it's subtle. I think it probably blends very well. Yeah, so those are all the food booths, and then of course we have the Paradise Garden Grill, which is going to have some different items uh, available. So at the Garden Grill, we have a pork belly bon mi. A pepperoni pizza egg roll, which <laughs> also sounds interesting. It kind of is in that same category with that hot dog earlier. An impossible cheeseburger mac and cheese and an Asian style beef barbacoa street tacos. Oh, that sounds really good. So you don't remember do you, the pepperoni pizza egg rolls, this is not new. This this is something that they actually had um before. They had it, I believe it was the Food and Wine Festival. They had these pepperoni oh. egg rolls. Um, but ag- again, out of this list, I I would try the things that stick out to me the most that I'd want to try are the Impossible Cheeseburger Mac and Cheese, just because again, we have not gone wrong with Impossible. If this was just regular Cheeseburger Mac and Cheese, I don't think I'd be as intrigued by it, but because it's plant-based, I'm intrigued. Sure. But the other thing that sounds really good that kind of caught me off guard that is even on this menu is the asian style beef beef barbacoa street tacos Mm -hmm. that sounds really really yummy too i agree uh barbacoa stuff has always been really Mm -hmm. really good Mm -hmm. so i would definitely be willing to try that although i will say when we were there uh and we had the the trio of tacos or whatever i was a little underwhelmed by those but the um yeah but Maybe this one will be better. So if you're like us and indecisive, because everything sounds delicious and amazing, you're in luck. There is going to be a Lunar New Year Sip and Savor Pass. Um, They have had it in the past. They haven't officially announced that it will be back in 2022 for this year. But I really I can't imagine that they wouldn't have it this year. Um, In 2020, the pass was forty two dollars. But again, that's previous year passes. We don't know what the new what the new price will be. Uh, the other thing, two magic key holders would would get a discount on the Sip and Saver Pass as well. So the Sip and Saver Pass, as long you know, you, you do have to kind of figure it out a little bit. We figured out what the what the price point was um, for Festival of Holidays, where it made sense to use a tab versus when it made sense just to pay for it out of pocket. I want to say it was seven dollars for Festival of Holidays as far as use a tab, don't use a tab. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you do go the Sip and Saver route, just remember to to kind of pay attention and make sure that you're not just using your tabs on lower priced items and having to later pay for the higher priced items out of pocket. Also, uh, I don't know if this is the case, but I feel like it would be. I feel like this is the way they're going to go about this going forward. Uh, If you have, if, if you want to buy stuff from the festival booths, if they do it like they did with the food and wine festival, um, you should, 
be able to buy stuff for any of the booths at any of the booths. So what we did the last day that worked really well for us is we went to one booth, we ordered all the food we wanted, and then we took that receipt to the different booths and picked up our food, mm-hmm. which worked out really good for us. So I would recommend doing that if that is an option this year. They haven't announced pricing for the Sip and Saver Pass yet. They also haven't released details on if you can do that. But I, I, my guess is it's going to be the same system for this as it was for that. So you'll be able to buy stuff at either booth. But there's been no official word yet. Well, of course, it also wouldn't be a Disney festival if we didn't have merch. What are the two like ingredients? Well, there's a few ingredients you need for a successful Disney Disney um, festival: food, merch, entertainment. I guess characters would be the last one. But yeah. so merch is what we're talking about now. Uh, t- this year. We're celebrating the Year of the Tiger. So, of course, they have a beautiful Year of the Tiger spirit jersey. There, We'll have a link in the show notes. They have all sorts of stuff. There's plushes. There's T-shirts. There's um, some, like, artwork of, like, a hand-animated Mulan that I can see in this picture. There's insulated cups. Tons and tons and tons. Ears, of course, ears. Um, lots and lots of different merch op- options. Yeah, the the spirit jersey looks kind of cool. I like the fact that, you know, normally the big lettering on the back of the spirit jersey is like Disneyland or Haunted Mansion. And uh, I don't know how to translate anything. It probably says like Happy New Year or Lunar New Year, but it's in different a different script, basically. And it looks super, super cool. Uh, the The plush is actually one that's kind of brought over from Shanghai Disneyland. So that's not something that's unique to Disneyland. But there's some cool options, and I'm sure more stuff is going to show up as we get closer and closer to Lunar New Year kicking off. I mean, this is just the first wave of stuff, and like Teresa said, it's not a it's not a event or a festival without lots of merchandise and food, and of course, we've already got food covered. So, so you want to know something crazy about the back of your Lunar New Year spirit jersey? It please it translates to celebrating the Year of the Tiger in Chinese. Oh, so cool. I mean. It's it's much more compact looking than than how we put, right. Dis- like you said, Disneyland or Haunted Mansion or you know those how it normally looks. So yeah, it's, it's very compact. It's very it's very beautiful too. It's like this metallic-y looking gold, very nice. I bet it, in the sun it probably looks really really good. Contrasting with the red of the shirt, mm-hmm. it's really quite striking. It does. It really pops. There's also a lot of really fun little like. Um, I don't want to call them figurines because they're more like I'll call them figurines, but they're more they're more like detailed and fancy. It's not like a toy. It's like something that you would put on display. One is of Chip and Dale dressed as little tigers, and it looks like they're hanging um, different things in a tree. It looks like they're hanging lanterns. Very, very cute. You also have Donald. Looks like he's um, playing playing some drums. So really cool. It's stuff that you don't. It's stuff that you don't normally see. Like you don't normally see these beautiful, like figures that are that are festival specific. Yes, of course, if you go over into Disneyana, you see, and um, off the page, you see more of these artistic pieces that have Disney characters on it. So it's really fun to see that these are incorporated into the festival merchandise. Did you see that even the new emos have outfits for Lunar New Year? Oh, cute! I did not see that, but yes, that's adorable yeah i was just scrolling through the merchandise and i was like oh that's cute <laughs> uh of course they have new emo stuff of course of course so another big thing that you need for a good disney celebration is of course entertainment disneyland.com has a really great uh write-up i guess a little really great small this is what all's going on so again Lunar New Year is being celebrated in DCA from January 21st to February 13th. Um, But some of the very cool things, highlights again, Mulan's Lunar New Year procession, which surprisingly has roots all the way back to the first Lunar New Year event in 2011. We have special appearances um, from favorites, including Mickey, Minnie, and of course, Tigger, since it is the year of the tiger. One big appearance, though, is Rhea from Rhea and the Last Dragon is appearing at the Lunar New Year celebration for the first time. They're actually going to have a dedicated area for her over in the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail area. So I'm very excited to see 
if they tr- like how they tra- if they transform the area and how they transform the area. I'm very excited. I think this is the first time Rhea is going to be in the parks. I could be wrong, but I I don't I think this might be her first time. So I think that's very very exciting. Oh, I think so too. That'll be really cool to see her in the parks. Uh, it's interesting that that Rhea was not in the parks, uh, but they were able to get Mirabelle in there so quickly, even yeah. before the movie came out. Yeah. So I don't know. I always like when Disney does their does their um, synergy so well, and you can go see things that were mm-hmm. just in the theaters or just in the uh, you know on Disney Plus or something in the parks. So I'm glad that she's going to make an appearance. Uh, for that as well i just i guess we'll wrap this up with saying this sounds like so much fun very excited for any and all weekly tears that get to go experience the celebration the music the entertainment the dancing even the drummers and all the fun (laughs) fun food offerings that they have i just these festivals are just i know it's so they're just so great i really i really appreciate and really love that they put these things on we just got to experience the festival of the holidays and i just love how they're embracing culture and embracing different you know things from different traditions and celebrations foods all sorts of stuff from around the world and it's not just same old, same old. So I think it's it makes it exciting because it's something fun and new, and I, you get to learn about new stuff. I think that's pretty darn cool too. I really enjoyed Viva Navidad. Um, that was that's probably one of my favorite things. It's such a fun interactive show. It sounds like, again, I haven't experienced it myself, but it kind of sounds like the um, processional is very similar to that too, where Mulan and um, Mushu come out, but there's also dancers and drummers, and there is a special float. Um, in it too so it sounds it sounds like it it could be similar i could be completely wrong but it just sounds like a really really fun time definitely on my disney bucket list unfortunately we won't be able to make it out this year but soon hopefully someday soon yeah i agree i think uh not this year but maybe next year we should try to Mm. you know we should make a ongoing list of things that we should make sure to attend uh per year and then we could stagger our trips during different times so over the next few years, we'll have gone to every holiday that the Disneyland Resort has and celebrates. I think that would be really cool. I like it. And we did get a piece of feedback from Sam, uh, who also happens to be our new supporter. Actually, Ter- uh, Vern, you might like this one. Hello, Tag and Teresa. My name is Sam Bailey. I have been listening to your podcast for about six months, and I just can't get enough. I'm a mail carrier for the post office in Oregon. I listen to past episodes all day long while walking my route. I look forward to every Wednesday's new episode. I had an idea I wanted to share with you and love to hear your thoughts. In a few of the earlier episodes, Tag had briefly mentioned that Disney should build a new park to help with the overcrowding issue. I think Disney should build a series of Disney outposts, perhaps five or uh, or so parks half the size of Disneyland located throughout the U.S., each one themed differently. The possibilities could be endless with a park theme to Nightmare Before Christmas or an entire park dedicated to villains. This idea came to me as a child when I had a recurring dream that Disneyland was moved and rebuilt in the giant field next to the house I grew up in. Well, that would have been awesome. (laughs) <laughs> Obviously, that would never have happened, but I feel my Disney Outpost idea has real merit. Thank you both for providing a little Disney magic in my day. Keep up your wonderful work. So thanks, Sam. Uh, Teresa, what do you think about I Disney love it. Outposts? I love it. Sam, you need to like go knock on the door of Imagineering or whoever to get this idea happen. I think this would be so, so great, especially with your idea of having them to be all different. Because when you were first saying this, I was like, yeah, but how are you going to fit all the great things in half, you know, if it's only going to be half the size of Disneyland? But the smart thing is to have them all different. So then, right, us crazy Disney fans will have to go visit all of them. And, you know, it's a different experience for each park, which is one of the things I really think is nice about all the different Disney parks over the world is that they aren't all exactly the same, that there are things that you can only experience at, you know, a b you know which, whichever park there are things you can only experience at disneyland there are things you can only experience in disneyland paris hong kong shanghai all those places i think that's really cool and i think that more uniqueness is better than more cookie cutters and having the exact same things i don't like i don't like when they copy paste attractions i understand why i think it's important for you to have you know the parks to have the same feel and you get that with having familiar attractions but i also think it's super super cool 
to have new new stories and new adventures that we can go on. I also love this idea. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be cool around the world even, but the United States, of course, is so large and we have parks on both sides. So those poor people like us that live in the Midwest have to travel far to go to either of them. So the fact that if there could be a couple you know, smaller parks. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I feel like it just kind of makes sense for Disney too, because they don't have to outlay a ton of money for an entire resort, you know, with a bunch of hotels and a whole huge theme park and everything that they could do a smaller investment in a smaller park. And you know, people would pay income and all that type of stuff. So I love this idea. I would vote for a villain's park somewhere in the Midwest because I would love to go to a villain's park and it would be super cool to have in the Midwest so we could more easily go to it. Yeah, you can build that villain's park and that Nightmare Before Christmas park just right here in the Midwest. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Both of those for for Teresa and and I. Yep, One northern Midwest, one southern Midwest. (laughs) There you go. But I love this idea and I think that, that it makes a lot of sense and they'd be cheaper to run. You don't have to have as many cast members and everything like that. I just think in general... Uh, it's also, I think, would be a lot easier for Disney to purchase plots of land that they would fit on uh, without needing yeah. huge swaths. And I just think it'd be easier to operate and everything. And I think they'd get greenlit more by, you know, local municipalities and stuff because it's not that they're going to be this ginormous thing that are going to bring in, bring in, you know, tons of people, uh, which some people are opposed to. So I love this idea. I'm glad that you emailed about it. And, um, so that's awesome. So maybe it'll happen, but now we just have to hope. So everybody send your letters to, to Disney and get it to happen. <laughs> it's okay. I'll be the only weekly tier without an answer. Make sure you send your questions to producer James or producer Vern at trivia at doweekly.net. Welcome back to Trivia Land, where we're going to find out those correct answers. Are you ready to find out how you did? Yes. I would love to know what the correct answers are, yes. (laughs) All right. Let's see how it went tonight. Your first question from my deep dive into the history of New Year's Eve at the parks. With 7,500 guests attending, what year was the first New Year's Eve party at Disneyland? You had guesses of 1962 and 1955. The correct answer that I was looking for was December 31st of 1957. So close. (laughs) Dang it. Your second question. New Year's Eve of blank launched the first Disneyland fireworks show, Fantasy in the Sky. The year you guessed... 1957 and 1958. What I was looking for was 1958. I accidentally got it right. <laughs> you accidentally got it right. <laughs> that ex- yeah, that was wow. I'm going to give you credit for that too, though, Tag. Okay. And the early shows were done by having cast members launch hand flares accompanied by music, and the shows lasted about five minutes. Could you imagine if you're that cast member boom, boom, <laughs> launching? The, oh my gosh! Wow, how far we've come! Yes, it wasn't until I believe 1966, if I'm remembering correctly, that they actually started doing what we would now recognize as the fireworks wow. show. Dang. Yep. Hmm. Your third question. In 1970, a giant Mickey clock was placed where on New Year's Eve? Crossing With my guesses fingers. of the train station and the castle, the correct answer I was looking for was the castle. Told you you'd get it, Teresa. <laughs> I was waiting for him to say the Matterhorn since that's the only like <laughs> big thing we didn't actually lock in. <laughs> I briefly considered saying that just for the looks on both your faces. <laughs> And your fourth regular question. Prior to 1984, you needed to buy an advance ticket to attend the New Year's Eve party. What happened that year that ended the need for the advance ticket? You both said that was the end of the ticket books. The ticket books ended in 1982. 
The creation of the annual pass oh. was 1984, and attendance of the New Year's Eve party was included in the annual pass and all day passes. Interesting. Mm. And so after 19, starting in 1984 and every year after, you no longer needed your advance ticket for the New Year's Eve party. Just any AP holder and any normal day pass holder can get in. Well, Disney, don't say that too loud, Vern, because I feel like Disney will be like, guess what? We have a New Year's Eve party, separate ticketed event. <laughs> Actually, uh, 2021 was the first time that it became more like the old days with the... Uh, 2021 registration system or reservation system it was more like the old ticket system for the new year's party sure that makes sense and your bonus question 2001 was the first year that disney california adventure hosted a new year's eve party why wasn't there a new year's eve party in disney california adventure before 2001 and you both got that correct because you knew that prior to 2001, Disney California Adventure was a parking lot. So that was our pity point. <laughs> that was, yes. Uh, it was a bonus question. You know, you, you're expected to get those. <laughs> that went better than I thought it was going to. <laughs> For you, yes. <laughs> but still, just overall, I really didn't think we had anything going in our favor there. So, dang. Good questions, Vern. Well, thank you. Well, listeners, how did you do listening at home? How do you think Tag and Teresa did? Have you ever been wanting to go down a rabbit hole and do some deep dive into a particular subject of your own? If you'd like to do that sometime, feel free to send in your own questions to us at trivia at dlweekly.net. Well, we will be back next week with more Disneyland news and information. So until then, go out and enjoy the parks. Please remain seated until the podcast comes to a complete stop and the doors have opened. Then collect your belongings, watch your head, and step carefully from the episode. On behalf of all of our crew, thanks for traveling with us. And we hope you have a happy and memorable visit here at DL Weekly.